ICT textbook is boring right? Do you believe it's too voluminous containing a lot of information? Even if you read it 1 million times, you might still not be able to answer a GCSE questions correctly. We have a solution for you. We have created all-in-one GCSE summary slides for each chapter. It covers the whole curriculum. We present it in a concise manner all you need to be an A-star student. The slide is well prepared by an ICT Cambridge examiner. After each topic, we provide GCSE related questions with answers. Download now. www.highsateemadeeasy.com Hi everyone, you are welcome to my channel, ICT Made Easy. Today I will be teaching you the main components of a computer system and this is going to be the part 2 of uh, chapter 1 series. If you haven't watched part 1, try to watch it before you continue with this part 2. Now basically, you might be thinking why do I made this video? Uh, it's because the textbook it looks quite complex by the way and when you are when you are taught in the class everything just quite simple but whenever you see the question you see that um, the question is more more advanced than what you um, than what you see in the class now because of that so I try to make everything quite simple then I make this video please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and you like this video and you can share with your friend as well Now, the learning objective today, at the end of this class, you should be able to answer any questions related to chapter 1. Any question related to chapter 1, you should be able to answer it at the end of this class. Now, I'm pretty sure you know what this uh, picture is all about. That's what you call a processor with a central processing unit, CPU. Some people used to call it processor. So CPU basically is the brain of the computer and the reason why they call it the brain of the computer is because it's the one that is executing every single task so in your computer. CPU, it controls all the functions in your computer system. Then if there is no CPU, it, there is no processor in your computer, then it means there is no computer because this processor is the one controlling every single thing you have in your computer. Now, we do have a lot of them. We do have some, some brand that are Intel and some are AMD. But Intel for sure are the most popular. If you check your computer as well, you will see your computer perhaps is using Intel processor or is using AMD processor. Now, let's quickly talk about types of computer memory. Types of computer memory. We do have two of it. One is the random access memory. So, and the second one is the read-only memory. Now, whenever we are talking about main memory, we are talking of two things. These are RAM or ROM. But when we are talking about secondary memory, then in that case, we'll be talking about the hard disk, we'll be talking about the uh, pen drive and some other storage devices. But main memory, or sometimes they call it primary memory, whatever name they call it, so it means they are talking about RAM and ROM. Now, for RAM, it stands for rand random access memory, then ROM stands for read-only memory. Then secondary memory, we do have a lot of them. So as you can see from the picture. So the most famous one are hard, hard drives or hard disk, then pen drive, memory card, and so on. Now, that's why from here you can easily digest all the information I mentioned. Secondary memory, we do have some that are fixed and we do have some that are removable, which means you can put them from one place to another. You can, you can detach them. You can remove them from your device. The ones that are fixed inside the computer system are hard disk drive or the D CD or DVD drive. All those ones are actually in your laptop or in your desktop. So we don't normally uh, take them out. But those that you can easily move around, things like pen drive, Blu-ray disk, DVD, and some other, um, and some other storage devices. So just take note of that. Some are removable, which means you can, you can move them from one place to another. And some are actually fixed. We are talking of secondary memory. 
primary memory for sure that one is always in the computer we don't actually move ROM or we don't actually move RAM anywhere it's always in the computer now main memory process how does it work this is how it works let's say that you want to collect any information let's say you want to access any file or any data in your computer so let me show you a very simple example here you want to access any file um, in your computer system then the processor in your uh, in your computer the processor um, is going to ask RAM it will process the data then it will ra it will ask random access memory to fetch the data if that data is actually in the random access memory it will be fetched otherwise it has to go to the hard disk to go and fetch the data however just of recently they have introduced another um, memory they call it catch memory or some people call it catch memory whatever the way you call it now you are here in the cpu as you can see the cpu the fastest memory ever it always contain all the program often used in your computer those are the things stored in the catch then the program that you normally use but not really often we have it so in the RAM and the one that you really use then you have it in the hard disk is virtually uh, you might be thinking why do we need to have catch and RAM is it compulsory well it's not compulsory long time ago but because your processor can actually fetch data from the hard disk straight away you want to all the data in your computer your microsoft word your browser games and anything program anything software is actually stored in the hard disk simple now if you want to if you want to open such program you need to ask the processor when you click it means the processor needs to access that program it needs to fetch data from that program from the hard disk but it always take time that's why they introduce what we call random access memory random access memory it might be 2 gb it might be 4 gb it might be 6 gb 8 gb it depends on um, which memory you have in your laptop now majority of the program you, you normally use something like google chrome something like maybe a uh, powerpoint slide microsoft word all the program you normally use they will be stored in the RAM in that case whenever processor need anything it will actually come to the RAM and fetch the data it will not go to the hard disk to save time you get it now then after some time they try to introduce catch memory also which means the most often used program they will be stored in the RAM and in the catch you know catch sometimes it might be only one gb you know most often program let's say all the program you have in your computer is 100 gb stored in your hard disk you might have only 4 gb only only 4 gb stored in the RAM. then out of that the one you always use maybe around 500 megabytes or 1 gb you have it in the catch so that whenever your processor want to you want to open such program your processor will, will search catch first is the program there if it is there then it will open very fast that's why you know whenever you want to open any program in your computer you will see it's very very fast because the program is actually in the catch memory then if it is not there it will ask is it in the RAM if it is there it will open if it is not there then it will now fetch the data in the hard disk and put it in the RAM and if you always use it later it will put it in the cache memory so take note how this one works now cache memory as I said earlier is the fastest type of memory it is located between processor and the RAM as you see from um, from here this is the processor and this is the RAM in between of this we have cache the most often used program we put it in the cache all right now then after that catch collect data from the RAM and oats onto commonly used data then the catch will automatically transfer the next set of data from the RAM into the catch so that 
it can be processed by the CPU. Now, let's talk about RAM. We talk about ra catch already, catch memory. Let's talk about RAM, which is random access memory. We say that is is also part of computer, of course, that temporarily store data instruction. Why do we say it's temporary? Yeah, because immediately you turn off your computer, all the data stored in the RAM will be gone, will be deleted. Then when you open your computer in the following day, another set of data, it depends on which program you are, you are using that day, then another set of program will be loaded in the RAM. So that's why we say it's volatile, then it is temporary use. Then it starts instructions currently running in the computer. Take note of that. The instruction, like for now, I'm using several programs. One of the programs I'm using is um, PowerPoint, presently, in my computer. Then that PowerPoint is actually in the RAM. You get the point? That power is in the, the program currently running in your computer. They are always stored in the RAM. Now, read-only memory. Read-only memory is ROM. Then it's a built-in memory. It's not something you can go to market and buy. We can go to market and buy RAM. If your computer is 4 GB RAM, you can increase it. You can buy another 2 GB or you buy another 4 GB or whatsoever. But for ROM, it's built-in. So it's not something you can buy in the market, all right? Then it normally st stores all the boot up instruction, all the programs you need to start your computer. Everything is actually stored in the room. All the programs you need to start up your computer, all the startup instruction, so they are actually stored in the room. That's why they are non volatile because they are permanent, they are always there. In as much as you want to turn on your computer, all the you know, necessary program you need to turn on your computer are actually stored in the RAM. So, uh, sorry, in the room, read only memory. That's why it is non volatile. Now, another thing you're supposed to know here are the secondary backing storage, or they call it secondary memory. Either secondary memory or backing storage is the same thing. Backing storage is also known as secondary storage. Then, backing storage is a non volatile, which means that data does not lost when computer is turned off. I gave you example earlier, our pen drive. If you have a pen drive, either you know you shut down your computer or you don't shut down your computer, whatever data you copy in the pen drive, it will still be there forever. So that's why it is non-volatile. So back in storage, all of them, they are non-volatile. Now, back in storage is used to store data for a long time, of course. And user tends to make copies of original file on back in storage. Now, it's just as simple as this, and let's try to look at some examples related to the topic, which is the main component of a computer system. In part one of this video, I talk about um, hardware and software. This time is main component of a computer system. Let's try to see how IGCAC asks question in this topic. Look at this question. There are a number of different internal hardware devices. Write down the most appropriate type of internal hardware that fits the following des uh, description. One, a volatile device that is used to store data. Don't forget, there are two things we let you know the answer here. Don't forget we are talking about the internal hardware. We are not talking about the external. Pen drive is not internal hardware. I, I explained that one in part one. Internal hardware are the hardware are the physical part of the computer which are inside the CPU, which are inside your computer. Something like sound card, video card, RAM, ROM, you know, a hard disk, all of them, they are inside the computer. We call them internal hardware. But those hardware, physical part of a computer that are outside the CPU case, we call them external hardware, something like a keyboard, mouse, headphone, projector, microphone, all of them, they are hardware. Yes, they are hardware, but they are not inside the computer. You get it now. Now, the question is talking about internal hardware. Then it says a volatile. Out of all the internal hardware we discussed, which one is volatile? Immediately you hear the word volatile. You should have known the answer, by the way that that is RAM, random access memory. Why is it volatile? 
because if you shut down your computer all the data stored in the RAM will be deleted just as simple as that let's look at question 2 or a b this is the main printed circuit board underline this main printed circuit board that's motherboard simple main printed circuit board that's motherboard non-volatile you see non-volatile non is one keyword then it, st it stores startup command startup instruction so that's room as i explained earlier then this electronic then provide the computer with the ability to produce sound to produce sound they are talking of internal hardware don't say microphone this one is a sound card it's not a microphone because microphone is not an internal hardware microphone is an external hardware right it's an external hardware so they are talking of internal hardware and anything has to do with sound that is sound card anything that has to do with image that is video card all right then you have to mind your spelling if you really want to get very nice mark here now this question says tick whether the following statements are true or false room is a real optical memory of course that is false ram stores the instruction you are currently working on i explained that earlier that is true room store the bios you know the meaning of bios basic input output system basic input output system yeah if i'm not mistaken that s stands for system basic input output which means they are the basic program basic instruction you need to start up your computer that's what you call bios all right so if the bios in your computer is having issue then your computer will not start correctly but if it is okay then your computer will start correctly so the answer is true RAM allows the user to read and write data then the answer is true you, you know the meaning of read and write read means copy and write means delete so when we say read and write it means you can copy data in the RAM and you can delete it yes data can be copied in the RAM then when you shut down your computer all those data will be deleted and when you open it next time another set of data will be copied in the RAM so take note of this kind of question now this one says describe the differences between ROM and RAM we just di discussed that one earlier data stored in RAM are volatile why you know RAM contains program currently running in the computer then we say that um, data stored in the room are non-volatile the another th thing you can say is the room contains bios or startup instruction you see just as simple four marks means four points but if you are so generous <laughs> and you have a lot of responses of course you can write as many as possible you just leave it for the examiner to choose any correct four any four answers that are correct so you don't really lo lose anything here try to give as many points as possible if they say it's four points don't just give ordinary four if in as much as you know what you want to write then try to give as many as possible at least if one doesn't correct another one we we correct now so based on this we don't have so much question on this then let's quickly move to operating system which is the part three but i'm going to join everything together in just only one video operating system for operating system what we'll be discussing here um, we'll be talking about different types of software we have the learning objective is you should be able to answer any questions related to operating system at the end of this video if you still see any question related to operating system and you are unable to answer the question it means you need to watch this video again or you need to refer back to your textbook to read more now and you can even download our um so our summary slide we have it on my website try to visit the website and you download it this slide that i'm using now operating system operating system is a software that manages the general operation of a computer system so the keyword here is uh, manage it manage the general operation of a computer system so manage or controls the general operation of a computer system so take note of this so we do have a lot of them so but basically operating system can be categorized into two 
one is graphical user interface as the first picture you see and the second is the command line interface graphical user which is gui and cli command line interface now function of operating system let's quickly talk about this what does it do why do we need to have an operating system in our computer now it helps user to interact with computer and that's what we call user interface as i showed you earlier we have cui uh, cli and gui so it helps user to interact with the computer that's what we use operating system for and then it provides security to the system it has file management it manages computer memory then it manages input output and backing devices so in your computer now types of user interface what are the two types we have as i mentioned earlier we have two types of user interface graphical user interface gui and command line interface cli if you are asked this kind of question in the um in your exam you can write just gui it's okay you will get marked for it and you can even write it finish you know complete graphical user interface the same thing applies to cli when we say graphical user interface there are a lot of examples of this so windows are using cli mac os ubuntu android ios blackberry os all of them so they are using operating they are using gui then gui basically is a user interface built around graphics take note of that around graphics why because it uses icons icons to represent programs it uses icons to represent programs as you can see from here then icons are images i've seen a question before in which they ask you to define what icons are so you just say icons are images simple or you say are pictures then those pictures represent program like this picture you are seeing it represents um firefox google chrome do you just an icon when you click on it then it will load that program this icon is representing a software it's representing a program now then it uses menus to select apps to select application or softwares so then the same thing is this so these are the um whenever you are asked to talk about the gui you can see anything you remember from this point so you can see the cursor as it is moving so you see the menu to select anything you see the icons all this one are what we call gui now for another thing you're supposed to know here is what we call touch screen technology touch screen technology touch screen so it's regarded as post gui post gui post gui it allows you it it allows the use of pinching scrolling expanding on the screen in which you don't actually need to be typing or anything any longer then another thing you're supposed to know here is cli which actually stands for command line interface then here you have to type commands to interact with the computer then cli are normally used by expert users why because it is a bit complicated then you need to learn commands you need to memorize commands so cli is now restricted to a number of predetermined options just like gui for gui everything is actually represented by icons it's represented by icons but in cli you have to type command yourself which means the more command you know the better your knowledge of interacting with computer will be long time ago we used to use cli but nobody is ready to memorize any command or whatsoever any longer so just cli or gui is just clicking clicking is a bit easier now what are the advantages and disadvantages of using gui of course the user doesn't need to learn any command the interface is easier to use can use a pointing device to click and select icons or menus options you want but the advantages is it take up more memory why because we are talking of icons icons are pictures it's like how many kilobytes let's say one icons is like 
100 kilobytes or 200 kilobytes and you are having like um, 200 icons in your computer you are having maybe in your desktop area you are having like 200 you just imagine so you take up more memory um, in your computer as compared to CLI so then it requires an operating system to operate you need to have an operating system before you can use GUI which operating system it depends maybe window maybe um, um, Mac or um, Ubuntu whatever any operating system you need an operating system before you use a GUI those are the disadvantages but CLI it has advantages as well the user has more freedom to use specific command in interacting with the computer you are not just limited to a number of predetermined um, options then it is possible to alter computer settings yes exactly so but disadvantages you have to learn commands you have to memorize command the command must be typed in without errors if you want it to work then it's not um, no visual aids means it is not user friendly it is not user friendly now let's look at some questions related to this operating system subtopic now this one says describe the benefits and drawback of using a gui rather than cli one of the things you can say here is gui uses icons and it is easier to operate computer gui does not require command memorization then gui takes up more computer memory because it's talking about benefits and drawbacks so you have to talk about it doesn't mean maybe you talk about three benefits one drawbacks it's okay or three drawbacks one benefit it depends or two two it depends on which one you know more which one you know more in as much as you have drawbacks and benefits in your response is okay you can claim your full mark now this one is still talking about GUI uh, CLI again describe the drawback of using CLI where it requires command memorization users have to learn commands commands should be typing type in correctly as you can see here right than the type of interface shown in the picture for sure the first one is okay the first one is CLI why the second one is GUI now this question is a bit is a medium question it's not difficult by the way it says IT technicians are set up are setting up a new file server for a school describe the benefits and drawbacks of using a CLI rather than a GUI to set up a new file server you see now what is the benefit of using CLI instead of GUI to set up this in CLI we say that or oh, this one confess but let's see CLI is usually used by IT experts to communicate with computer interface right so when the question says describe or discourse so don't forget you need to give you need to give a meaningful conclusion you can actually use one of your points one of the points let's say you want to talk about six points you can just use five points and you use the sixth one to give your conclusion all right so you will get marked for that in CLI users are not restricted to the predetermined icons it is easier to alter computer settings CLI involves command memorization so because it's talking about benefits and drawbacks then the user requires to learn the command then the user must type the command correctly as well although CLI is difficult to use due to command memorization but it is more accurate for IT technicians to, to, IT technicians to set up file server all right now let's quickly look at part four of this video now here we'll be talking about types of a computer types of a computer or type of computer system now basically the learning objective here as i always tell you if you study chapter one and you still you are unable to answer any questions related to chapter one then it means before you go to chapter two try to study it back try to look at it back now introduction a computer basically is an electronic machine which helps in solving problem quickly and easily 
though no no one will be asking you to def uh, uh, to to define a computer system in IGCSE by the way they will not, but it's just a knowledge you're supposed to know it's an electronic machine if you want to s if you don't want to say that you can say it's source program according to instruction given to it and that is a software then or you can say that a computer is a digital machine so which uses binary digits now for types of computer the first one we have here is mainframe computer it has its own benefits so then and it has disadvantages as well then another one i believe you know this you can see it has different components um cpu case mouse monitor and um and a keyboard so this kind of computer we call it desktop computer but the computer which has everything in a single unit this is the monitor the screen the keyboard is here the touchpad is here and the cpu case is actually here now everything in a single unit we call it a laptop computer so then the kind of computer that is quite small and it has a touch screen technology so we call it tablet and finally we have a smartphone now let's look at them one by one when we say mainframe computer as you can see from here mainframe computer they are big computers with which has big which has processing many processing power so the reason why we said they are big computer not they are big because of size of course they are they are big in terms of size as well but we don't when we say something is a big computer it doesn't mean it is big because it has a very big size but because of the processing power so it has many processing power and because of that is um they have a big memory as well and they are actually used in big companies why yeah because many users can use it at a time many users can access the server at a time so that's why we call it mainframe computer any computer which has this kind of capability then we ha we call it mainframe computer another type of computer is desktop computer for this desktop computer these are known as personal computer pc then they have their components separately keyboard mouse monitor cpu in fact if they ask you what a desktop computer you just say that desktop computer are type of computer which has all its components separately what are the components mouse keyboard monitor and cpu case so are separate then they are difficult to move around of course this is one of the disadvantages then they are cheaper compared to um laptop that's an advantage then they are widely used in offices then they are always connected to an external power source they don't use batteries they don't use batteries majority of desktop computer don't use batteries now what if a laptop yeah it's like the opposite a bit of opposite of desktop we say that in desktop all the computers all the components are look all the components are in separate units but here in laptop we say that all the components are in a single unit take note of that then they are portable and easier to move around then they use battery so they don't actually depends 100 percent on electronic or on on electric power then they can connect wirelessly to join to the internet now what about tablet computer tablet computer is like a laptop by the way but the only thing is it is portable and it's smaller they use touch screen technology then are sometimes used for phone calls through a sim card now you can see when we say that um, tablet computers are portable and are smaller this is not a unique features of them we can actually see what is a tablet computer is a tablet computer or any computer that are smaller and they are portable no even you can see some some laptops as well that you know something like a notebook that they are quite small they are not that big they are quite small as well so this is not a unique feature they use the touch screen technology of course some laptops also using touch screen technology 
Okay, even smartphone are using touch screen. Even some desktop computer are using touch screen technology as well. But the only thing that laptops will never do is you can never use your if you put a SIM card, it's not possible to put your to put a SIM card in a laptop and you make a phone call. It's not possible to do that. Then this only uh, peculiar to tablet computer. So take notes. Now, for the last one, which is a smartphone, we say smartphone is an advanced mobile phone. All right. Smartphones are just like Nokia and, you know, all those old phones. So the advanced mobile phones are called smartphone. Why are they smart? Yeah, because they can connect to the Internet and virtually every single thing you can do, you can do in your laptop. You can do it on your phone as well. So, but when we say smartphone, why is it smart? That's why when you have smart car, smart home, why all of them we put smart, smart, smart? The reason is they are, they are connected to the internet. That's why they are smart. Then it has touch screen technology as well. Now, let's quickly look at some questions related to this. First, this one says a computer that is only used in one place. What do you think? Computer that is only used in one place. It's not possible to move around. Yeah, that's desktop. Must always be connected to an external power. You see, we just talked about it. Must always be connected to an external power. Desktop also. Small enough to fit into, into a pocket. Of course, that's smartphone. Then a mobile device which is uh, with a large keyboard and display so that would be a laptop now let's see another question people can access the internet using mobile cell phone using their mobile phone or smartphone laptops and their pc compare and contrast the use of these devices to access what is the benefit of using smartphone to access internet instead of using laptop what's benefit of using laptop to access internet instead of using pc which is the desktop. That's what the equation is talking about. Yeah, you can see things like mobile phones or you say uh, laptops are portable so and PC are not. Keyboard on mobile phones is smaller. So because of that, then it is difficult to type. Okay, don't just say it's smaller and you quiet like that. Try to complete the sentence. So keyboard on mobile phones are smaller and because of that, it's difficult to type. Then, because of that, many people, some people may actually prefer to use laptop instead of using mobile phone to solve internet. Mobile phone display, you know, mobile phone display is smaller so than laptop or PC. Because of that, it might actually, it might not show all the pictures or videos you are watching or whatsoever. Then phone, uh, may not be able to access certain website yes then signal is likely to be more reliable with pc because it's actually using cable then slower to access the internet with mobile phone then may not always be able to access the internet using a mobile phone or laptop more likely to have a mobile phone with you yes it's more likely you have a mobile phone with you because of that it's easier to use it to access internet always then can access the internet from a greater number of places with a mobile phone. Exactly. Easier to use a mobile phone while on the move. So a laptop and PC is not possible to do that. Sometimes are not mobile friendly. Oh, some sites, sorry. Some sites are not mobile friendly. Because of that, you cannot use mobile phone. So you have to use your PC or laptop so whatever points you say here is okay whatever point you mention here I'm pretty sure this kind of question might be six max which means you need to mention six points so but I just give you a lot of options here you can write anything you want from this option right John want to create his report and is working in, in the jungle uh, the question wants to say that compare the advantages and disadvantages of using a sm smartphone rather than using laptop don't forget this guy is actually in the jungle then what are the advantages of using smartphone instead of using laptop in the jungle it has a lot of advantages by the way 
because one of the advantages is for the smartphone it is smaller it is lighter therefore it's easy to carry right don't forget it's in the jungle then very difficult to use to type to type up the report as the screen is smaller right that's the advantage of using smartphone then easier to use than a laptop then difficult to type as well then smartphone has a video or digital camera which is quite easier for you to take any picture you want to take then due to screen or keyboard size more errors in typing you know when you are typing and other things the position of the camera is better than the webcam on the on the um on the laptop exactly then data cannot be saved to an external device and it's quite easy to do that on laptop drone is more likely to have the smartphone with him every time whereas when if it is a um, laptop it has to be carrying it is an extra luggage for him then a smartphone can easily be used as a voice recorder so and it's a bit you need a specialist or specialized software to do that in um so in laptop now wi-fi signals or data network are less reliable in remote areas now and finally a laptop needs to use of other equipment like a camera then it becomes more cumbersome to carry around let's say in your laptop you need to carry some P so you need to for for the report drone actually needs to take some recordings and some other things which means it has to carry the digital camera and it needs to have the laptop is quite heavy but the smartphone can actually do the work so i give a lot of answers here you don't need to mention everything it depends so whatever the question says then depends how many points you are going to give all right then less memory than a laptop which means smartphone it has less memory than laptop then a laptop has a more powerful processor than a smartphone as well now the platform of this video which is going to be the last one is going to be emerging technology emerging technologies i will talk about that in a while impact of emerging technology Emerging technology, these are the technology that are likely to make a great impact in our society. And in fact, all of, majority of them, we've been having them around, by the way. So we are going to discuss them. You will see them in a moment. When we say the learning objective here is to be able to answer any question related to this topic at the end of this video. Now, Emerging technology are those that are likely to make a great impact on our everyday life in the future. That's what we call emerging technology. Then just like artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, it has been around for, you know, for almost many years back now. So, and virtually majority of the application now, they have AI, artificial intelligence in them. AI, it deals with developing machines and software with human-like intelligence right when the software or any machine are actually behaving just like human then they call it artificial intelligence we do have a lot of examples one of them is expert system expert system is an example of ai all right so expert system is being used in many places of course we do have medical expert system you have um um you have mechanical expert system, the, the one they use in the workshop to diagnose your car. So we do have a lot of expert system these days. Then another one, another example of AI is robotics. Robot robotics, it has been around, you know, many years back now. And of course, we are going to learn much about robotics in, in chapter five. Technologies that deal with automated machines and it can be programmed to take the place of human in dangerous em environment or manufacturing processes. It can be designed to resemble humans in appearance and behavior. Then another emerging technology is language. Computers are programmed to give interpretation of different human languages as they are spoken to them. Now, another one is game playing. Of course, this one is quite famous now as well. That's when human being is actually playing with a robot, all right? Then, 
what are the impacts AI can actually have on our everyday life? Well, it's increased our leisure time, so you have enough time to do um, different things. Instead, you can just ask the robot to do some of your um, daily routines. Then you can have more uh, leisure time. Then accurate prediction of weather. Weather. We actually use AI for this instead of using human being. Then another thing is increased personal in increased personal safety. So AI software is used in modern home alarm system, something like an intru uh, intrusion um, detector system, intru intrusion detec detector system. So and we do have a lot of them as well. So which actually increase personal safety. Then in improved medical care as well. We do have a lot of application nowadays which are used um, to take some readings from the patient then it will send it to the doctor now then based on that we do have it also is is even artificial intelligence is being used um in transport in transport as well that's when you have a driverless car these days and it's it's, it's already existing in some of the countries the self-driving car as well so it's becoming quite famous now then another example of ai is visual vision enhancement so this is also known as virtual reality virtual reality is being used is one of the latest technology majority of the youngster used to use now it just needs to put it on then you can um, see different pre-recorded videos so but there are some devices you need to consider here things like headset then tracker ball and some other um, devices we are going to talk we are going to talk about them in a moment then objects appear closer for the user of the system then used by military to carry out surveillance at night not only by military even by gamers they also use it a lot now then another one is biometrics biometrics which actually refer to authentication techniques that rely on measurable physical characteristics of an individual that can be automatically checked biometrics we do have different types fingerprint eye recognition then eye recognition either the retinal one or the iris one then voice recognition as well so some um, biometrics they actually use your voice um, as a means of security now the impact of biometrics well it is being used in airports a lot then increased house security as well so it has a lot of impact that fingerprint is used in some workplaces as well in order to mark the attendance of the employee instead of asking the employees to write down their attendance in which they can write attend they might write attendance for each other just they just use their um their fingerprint then it's not possible to to um to log in or to sign in with another person's finger now secure mobile phone of course we are using um this uh, fingerprint in our mobile phones these days and it reduces car theft now let's look at some examples some past year questions on this now this question says many computer systems use virtual reality yes explain what is meant by virtual reality where you can say virtual reality this when you replicate an environment or real life scenario through a computer system something that is happening a real life scenario you replicate it into a computer that's what you call a virtual reality when we say something is a reality is a real life scenario then virtual means it's a fake okay virtual is a fake one so you replicate an environment or you replicate a real life scenario like shooting you replicate it into a computer so then it can be explored and interacted with by a person that's what you call a virtual reality what are the two pieces of hardware used in virtual reality system yeah they use joystick a lot then vr virtual reality headset is also used now another one here look at this question 
He says that some smartphones connected to the internet can allow the user to point their phone's camera at an object or image to display information about it on the phone screen. Yes. Now, the object acts like an item in a search engine. This is called augmented reality. Augmented reality. We do have to virtual reality, augmented reality. One example of its use is in mobile games, where the user try to catch character from the game as the character appears to walk in the street. Now, explain using example other ways in which augmented reality could be used in everyday life. Augmented reality is being used in many applications in many ways these days. In many ways these days. One of it is a user can actually gather information about a certain place or building. You don't need to go there. You just need to have some application in your phone. Then it can actually show you how the place looks like. All right. So then that's actually very similar to Google Street. Google Street. Some of you, if you have that application in your phone, you can even look, you can even look in at some street that you've never been before on Google. So just like you are there physically. So that's what you call augmented reality. Now a user can visualize what something will look like, you know. For example, when looking at a new house without physically going there. Yeah, that's possible. User can be used can use augmented reality to locate a destination like the airport. Users can visualize how close we look like on them while shopping online is possible all right thank you for watching guys and at the end of this video i believe any question related to chapter one you should be able to answer them you can try to visit my website to download this slide if you actually need it then the topical question you will see at the end of each subtopic i was giving you some topic uh, some igcac question related to that subtopic i have the list of all the igcse question together with answer related to chapter one chapter two chapter three chapter four until chapter 10. so just try to visit my website www.ictmadeeasy.com to download all those topical questions as well as the slide so see you for chapter two i'm going to make another video for chapter two as well Bye. I wish you the best in your exam.